Hello everybody, welcome to Unit 4 Biology Area Study 1. Today our focus is going to be on changes in the genetic makeup of a population. So in this component of the study design, we're going to be looking at mutations, we're going to be looking at genetic drift, so the bottleneck effect and the founder effect, we're going to be discussing natural selection, and we're going to be looking at speciation and artificial selection as well. All right, so just starting off with um, a couple of vocab words that you will be familiar with um, that we're just going to revise quickly. So a population is a group of individuals that are from the same species um, and they are located at the same region at the same time. A genotype is a way that we can identify the alleles that are present for a particular gene. So we usually use letters to identify those alleles. A gene pool is the frequency of all of the alleles that are in or of each gene. Okay, so remember alleles are the alternate forms of a gene that we can have where we have that dominant or recessive allele. Um, evolution is the change in genetic makeup of a population over a long period of time, so over generations. Natural selection is a process by which individuals are better adapted to the environment. They're the ones that are going to be able to survive and pass on their characteristics. And finally, a selection pressure is an environmental factor that is going to impact the survival or reproduction rate of an individual. So onto mutations. Now, a mutation is a change in the genetic material that makes up a gene. Okay, so it commonly can form a new gene or it's mainly altering the encoded instructions of the DNA. So it's a change in the location of a gene um, that can alter the expression of the gene. And remember, genes usually code or can code for proteins. Mutations are what we call spontaneous, okay? So they can occur whenever, or they can be induced where they are affected by exposure to mutagenic agents um, like X-rays or gamma rays or various chemicals. So when we discuss mutations, we can split them into three different categories. So the first one that we have is a point mutation. Now a point mutation is affecting one single um, DNA base. Okay, so that can happen via substitution where we're swapping out one DNA base for another. It can um, be an insertion point mutation, which is where we are inserting or adding an extra um, DNA base or deletion where we are deleting or removing a DNA base. So the effect that a point mutation can have, um, it can be a silent mutation, which means it doesn't affect the amino acid or the polypeptides that are going to be produced. Okay, so a silent mutation is where the DNA um, base that is being altered is going to code for the same amino acid. Okay, because remember there's different um, codons that can code for the same amino acid. So that's what we call a silent mutation where there hasn't really been a change. A nonsense mutation is a base substitution that's going to result in a codon coding for a stop codon, okay, rather than um, building that amino acid. So it's going to result in the stopping of the production of that particular protein. A missense mutation is a base substitution that results in an amino acid alteration. So it results in a different amino acid, and this can be conservative or non-conservative. So we can split missense mutations two ways. A conservative missense mutation is where the change in the amino acid is an amino acid that has similar chemical properties. Okay, so it's going to result in an amino acid that's quite similar. Whereas non-conservative missense mutation is where the amino acid is going to result in a different um, chemical property. So the protein is probably not going to be able to carry out its normal function. So point mutations, we are referring to single bases. A frame shift mutation is where we have the insertion or deletion, okay, either of single bases or of um, certain blocks, um, which are going to affect the reading frame of um, the DNA sequence. So they're going to affect the triplets that are after where the mutation has occurred. And you can go through this example over here, which is showing you the effect of um, 
inserting a single base and how it's affected the rest of the reading frame and deleting a single base and how it's also affected the rest of the reading frame. We then have a block mutation. So a block mutation is affecting a chunk, all right? Um, and these are chromosomal changes that affect large segments of a chromosome. So we have an inversion is where a segment of chromosome is going to rotate 180 degrees. We have deletion, um, where part of the chromosome is going to be deleted. We have duplication which is where um, one segment is going to be duplicated or doubled, uh, copied. Um, and then we have translocation, which is the exchange between different chromosomes. All right, moving on. So in terms of looking at evolution now, we know that evolution is the change inheritable characteristics um, of a particular by a population over a long time so over multiple generations this can result as an effect of the mutations that we've spoken about okay that are then going to be passed on to the next generation or they can result from selection pressures on a population so if we're looking at natural selection natural selection itself okay selection can be broken up into two major categories so that's what we have natural and artificial Artificial is involved with selective breeding where humans are intervening and we're going to speak about that a little bit later on. But natural selection is what's occurring in the wild. So this is a process where new heritable traits are going to evolve and persist in the population due to selecting agents. So based on the environment, based on climate change, based on predation, um, competition, pollution, things like that will have an effect. So Natural selection occurs when any of these selecting agents are going to act on a population in the wild and produce differences in the survival and reproduction rates of different individuals. So some individuals in a population are going to be better adapted or better suited to dealing with those selecting agents. Okay, And those that are able to survive, they're the ones that are going to be able to reproduce and pass on those favourable traits. So individuals are constantly competing with others of the same species in competition with others from different species to try to avoid parasites and disease causing microbes a part of them trying to survive so different individuals are going to cope with these selection pressures in different ways and some are going to be more successful so when we're answering a question that's related to natural selection these are the steps that we need to make sure we include in our answer so we always need to start off by saying that there's variation in the population okay so no individual none of them are all the same there is a lot of differences um, variation in traits is also able to be inherited. All right, overproduction of offspring, there's going to be high population growth. But basically, selection pressures are going to result in a struggle to survive. Okay, so those individuals that are have the advantageous traits, they're the ones that are going to be able to survive. And obviously, if they're the ones that can survive, they're the ones that are going to be able to reproduce and pass on that information to the next generation okay and that's what we also call survival of the fittest so we need to talk about variation in the population those that are better suited they're the ones that survive those that survive reproduce and pass on those favorable characteristics in terms of looking at the effect of natural selection this does cause a reduction in the genetic diversity as it's only allowing those that are better suited to the environment um, to survive advantageous traits are therefore going to become a lot more common and those disadvantaged traits, obviously those individuals that are dying and not able to reproduce, they're not going to be passing on their characteristics. So those disadvantaged traits become less common. There's a larger genetic variation in a population resulting in a higher change of survival of the species. And a larger population is also more likely to have greater genetic variation as well. All right, in terms of looking at genetic drift, so gene flow, um, is where we're talking about migration and the movement of um, different alleles. Okay, so in terms of looking at the introduction of alleles, we can look at immigration and emigration. Imi, so with an I, is coming inside our population. Emi is um, leaving or exiting our population. So when we look at genetic drift, there's two major types that we talk about. They are the bottleneck effect and the founder effect. So when natural selection was favoring one allele over another okay those that have the advantageous trait are the ones that survive 
genetic drift doesn't doesn't um, favor one allele over another okay so both alleles are going to be equally subjected to being affected by genetic drifts um, and the smaller the population the more impact genetic drift is going to have on that population okay so it's going to result in a, a massive decrease or decline in those favorable alleles in the gene pool and if there's a loss of favorable alleles there is the possibility of extinction. So allele frequencies of a larger population are going to be more stable because there's more variety in that population. So they're less likely to get affected. In terms of looking at our two types of genetic drift, we've got the bottleneck effect and the founder effect. So the bottleneck effect occurs when a large chunk of a population is drastically reduced um, as a result of a natural disaster. So it could be a bushfire, it could be flood, it could be disease, it could be predation where those that are left over, okay, those that survive are the ones that are going to be reproducing to give the next generation. And they're not often really representative of what the original population might have been. So the population is going to rebuild, but it's going to be a different allele frequency to the original population. And so it's going to reduce the genetic diversity. We've then got the founder effect. And the founder effect is when we've got our large population, okay, but a small part of that population decide to form a new colony. So we call that the founder group, okay? So it's where a new colony is going to be started by a couple of members from the original larger population. So this new colony as well is likely to have reduced genetic variation because they're not um, necessarily a um, representation of what the original colony, uh, the original population may have been. And the new colony is also going to be a non-random sample of the original population. So as a consequence, again, um, they might evolve in a different direction than what the parent population was. So again, the founder effect may cause high incidence of, of inherited diseases as well as there's less genetic variation. The next part that we look into into this component of the study design is allopatric speciation. Now, speciation is where we're looking at um, one species basically or one population being broken into two different species. So the way that we can test whether two animals are of the same species is when we mate them and when they produce offspring, we need to make sure that those offspring are viable, which means they can live, and they are fertile, which means they can reproduce. So if two animals are of the same species, they can produce viable, fertile offspring. In terms of looking at the steps of allopatric speciation, it's where we've got a parent population, um, mutations may arise, there may be different selection pressures, and over time, when there's a barrier between them, um, even once that barrier is removed, the two populations that are left over are reproductively isolated, and so they can form a different, different species. So it's where a population forms a new species after being geographically isolated, so in terms of location, um, from their parent population. So an example of a geographical barrier could be something like a river separating um, the population into two. The final part that we look at for this part of the study design is selective breeding. Now, selective breeding, we can say, is the opposite of natural selection in that it involves human intervention. So it is a form of artificial selection where humans are deliberately going to choose specific traits and mate specific animals together. So this is quite common in the dog breeding industry and the dairy industry, and I've got quite a few other examples here where artificial selection may be used. So the survival and reproduction in selective breeding is going to be at great risk as those selected features that we may be choosing against may not necessarily best equip those animals for surviving in the wild. So they become very domesticated. So things like sphinx cats, um, we breed them, they don't have hair, and they can't maintain body temperature in the wild. English bulldogs have been um, bred again, um, they have short snouts and therefore they're going to have breathing issues. The Jacobin pigeon, it has large feathers around the head, okay, it looks very nice, but in terms of um, being in the wild, they're going to have issues seeing. So there's features that are going to affect the survival rate of a population. Their life expectancy might be lowered, and again, genetic diversity is lowered. There's going to therefore be a massive reduction in the gene pool size. If you have any questions regarding this part of the study design, 
please leave your questions in the comments below. Give this video a thumbs up and bye.